about oceans. And I'm really excited that we have a speaker here to speak on oceans, because here we are in Montana, and it's sometimes easy to forget just how much of our planet is actually ocean. 70% um, of our planet is ocean, as Mike talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, so most of our water that we have on the Earth's surface is locked up in the oceans. And that means that oceans drive all kinds of things. They drive the climatic fluctuations that are slightly <coughs> frustrating this year with, uh, well, for those people that are frustrated by the lack of snow, um, might be, uh, they help drive climatic fluctuations that in turn affect precipitation. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about how oceans are affected by human use and consumption processes. Uh, just last week, the World Bank announced a new global alliance partnership between 17 different countries focusing on ocean use and restoration um, because one of the reports that came out from the World Bank just last week showed that over 25% of our protein around the world, so our human protein consumption comes from ocean, um, ocean, uh, ocean fish or other products. So a lot of our protein we get from oceans. Um, Science News last week published an article that the ocean acidification that's taking place right now is probably the highest that it's been in 300 million years. And for those of you ha ha that have taken classes in climate change, um, you're familiar with this um, process of ocean acidification and how that's affecting carbon sequestration across the planet. So we see oceans come up over and over again when we talk about natural resources issues. Um, so with that in mind, hopefully I've given you a, a nice interlude into paying attention tonight for the, um, just how important it is to know a bit about our oceans. I'm going to go ahead and introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, this speaker tonight, Chris Pallister, has traveled the furthest of any of our speakers. He's coming to us from Alaska. Uh, he's the co-founder and president of a nonprofit organization called Gulf of Alaska Keeper. They uh, clean up marine debris across the Gulf of Alaska along remote beach, beach um, and coastlines in Alaska. He has an academic background in biology. He is a UM alum. He received a law degree from Lewis and Clark College and also the University of Washington. He was a Robert Noss Sea Grant Fellowship um, winner and worked with um, Senator Frank Murkowski as an aide to natural resources and environmental issues. He's a longtime resident of Alaska and loves to work and recreate in its water. He has been involved with the Exxon Valdez oil spill cleanup effort, and every year he organizes volunteer cleanups in Prince William Sound, focusing on marine debris cleanup, which he's going to be discussing some about tonight. His talk tonight is going to focus on his work with Gulf of Alaska Keeper. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the organization, since 2002 when it was formed, Gulf of Alaska Keeper has been a nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect, preserve, enhance, and restore the ecological integrity, wilderness quality, and productivity of Prince William Sound in the North, North Gulf Coast of Alaska. The organization focuses on the cleanup of marine debris from Alaska's most remote coastlines. Most of the debris cleanup involves removing plastics, and much of the plastic debris has traveled thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean to litter the beaches of coastal Alaska. Tonight, he's going to tell us about his organization's work in Alaska and the often overlooked but growing issue of marine debris in our oceans. So with that, I'll hand it over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, thanks for uh, bringing me here. Man, that sounds loud, is it? Is it okay, or is it too loud? Perfect. Okay. Uh, I want to thank Natalie for inviting me down here. It's uh, nice to get back to Missoula. I spent nine years in this town, and actually, I was really anxious to leave when I left, and I haven't <laughs> haven't been back hardly since. But it's a nice place. Alaska is nicer, and you can see from this picture, it's no place for piles of trash to be. It's just not. And uh, I have a lot of area to cover tonight. This is really a broad subject and I have an amazing amount of slides here so I'm going to zoom right along and fits my ADD personality perfectly and I hope you can all tolerate it. 
But um, we have a small group. We started to focus on marine debris issues. We, we became aware of how bad the issue was back in the late 90s. And then in 2002, as Natalie said, we started working hard on cleaning up these project, our beaches. But we were doing it on a volunteer basis. And we'd take up to 100 people out with us, remote cleanups, boat-based remote cleanups. And after four years, we only had 70 miles of beaches clean. And there's 3,500 miles of beaches in Prince William Sound alone. So we did the math and said, at this rate, it's going to be 200 years before we make one circle of the sound. So we decided we needed to incorporate, become a nonprofit, start raising money, and try and do more of a professional, extended effort at this. So let me see if this will work now. This is our operational area, basically. This is northern Gulf of Alaska. We are based in Anchorage, but our boats are, are berthed here in Whittier. We work out of Whittier, Seward, and Homer. And we clean all this. We've been working in all this area for the last 10 years. I mean, to give you an idea of scale, boat trip down around here to Elizabeth Island is probably about 250 miles. And this is the open Gulf of Alaska, so it's pretty uh, amazing rough weather or rough water to work in. but. It's been going pretty well, actually. This, just for your information, is a big dust storm blowing off the Copper River Delta out into the Gulf of Alaska. And that's why this body of water is so rich, because it's always getting this uh, nutrient in there. This is a, a pretty infamous spot called Gore Point. It catches a tremendous amount of debris. But it's not by any sense unique in Alaska and uh, that northern Gulf Coast. There are places like this scattered all up and down uh, Shelikoff Straits, Barren Islands, outside of Montague Island. We'll get to that later. So just looking at that, you think, wow, how can this be? It's not coming from Alaska. Where the heck is this stuff coming from? We just decided to dive into it and see what we could do about it. And as all organizations, you don't function well unless you have good people. And we have really good people working for us. This is Ted Rayner, our field manager. He's been with us since the start. He's our chief photographer. Most, a lot of these pictures are his, but not most of them. Um, he's really dedicated to this. It's all he lives for. And I'm extremely lucky that I've had my three boys working for me since we started this thing. They run the boats. They do the data collection. They keep the equipment running and work with the crews and run the crews. And it's, it's been great. Couldn't do it without them. I stay in town all summer and they go out and work their butts off. We have, of course, a lot of volunteers. But these two guys have gone out every year, take their boats out. They both have big boats. They haul volunteers for us. They go out on all of our monitoring projects, which we'll talk about more later. And they go out on our volunteer cleanups. And then, of course, we have lots of volunteers. Over the years, we've had thousands of volunteers. Each year, we put in about 4,000 to 4,500 volunteer hours on these cleanup projects. And they do a tremendous amount of work for us. But we also have our professional crew that stays out all summer. We also get a lot of support from the charter fleet. And this is four different charter operators that work for us year after year after year. This is actually Ted's boat, our field manager down here in the right-hand corner that is now works with us full time. So over the years, this kind of gives you a list of what we've done. I won't go over it too much. But one thing is we pulled off 350 tons of plastic off over 1,000 miles of coastline in the last, just since 2006. It's a tremendous amount of plastic. You know how light it is. Other than the nets that we pick up, everything else is pretty light. Um, we do have a monitoring project where we monitor a bunch of beaches. We do that every year. And uh, anyway, that's just kind of the highlights of it. I don't know why this thing doesn't seem to work. We have a lot of sponsors, but our primary funders are federal. And the federal agencies, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, have been our biggest backer. The US Forest Service is now backing us. They've given us four years of funding. 
just recently we got a really big grant from the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. It's going to give us three seasons of substantial funding. And that money came from the Exxon oil spill, this liability settlement with the state and the federal government, and they put it out for habitat enhancement projects. And uh, they thought, you know, this plastic is just hydrocarbons, it's just refined oil coming back to pollute our beaches again, so it's a good use of the money. So, And then a lot of other supporters and sponsors there. Marine debris. Persistent solid material chucked in the ocean. Um, you, you know, we can go into what that is, talk about it all night long, but it's basically anything people manufactured or, or modified and then it's on the beaches or in the water. Some unbelievable amount of garbage goes in the ocean every year. What's that say? See how it, the estimates vary. That's from six million tons to seven billion tons. Nobody really has a handle on it, although it's just staggering. Hmm. We have, other than our volunteer cleanup, we also do our marine debris surveys. We have our profession, professional projects that usually spend a month or so in Prince William Sound and then a couple months out on the Gulf of Alaska on the northern coast there. We have our monitoring projects and our net sapling that goes along all concurrently with that stuff, although the monitoring is a separate project. And recently we've teamed up with the College of William and Mary and University of Alaska Anchorage to look into the toxicity of this stuff. It's been my belief since the start that all these inherent chemicals in this plastic can't be good for things. And they are now have found out, University of Washington, a lot of studies on it, this plastic that comes out of the the Pacific has been out there for years circulating around, adsorbs a lot of industrial pollutants, uh, persistent organic pollutants that are basically hydrophobic and ad adhere to the plastic really well and then it's all transported to shore. Um, they have measured the concentrations of these pollutants like dioxins and PCBs and all those nasties you hear about in the water column and then they test on the surface of the plastic and on the surface of the plastic the concentrations will be a million times higher than what's in the water column. So they're pretty effective at picking all this crap up and transporting it to the shoreline. Um, I'm just going to go kind of through our projects here just really briefly. We do surveys. Of course all of our sponsors want us to do surveys and quantify what's out there before they give us money. They're not going to give us money to go clean a beach that's already clean. So we. We've already surveyed 1,200 miles of beaches and you basically do that by walking on it. You cannot, we've tried doing low, uh, low elevation aerial surveys. We've tried uh, just driving by the shoreline on boats and stuff. You can't see it. You got to get up there and walk on the beaches to see this stuff. So we put a lot of, lot of hours and a lot of miles into that, all done by uh, volunteers. Uh, this is kind of the reasons why we do the surveys. Um, it, it's been really good for us for allocating our resources. We go out and do a bunch of surveys and then we can plan out two or three years in advance what we want to do, what beaches we want to hit and where we want to use volunteers. Such, you know, you can't put volunteers just on any beach. You have to put them someplace where there's garbage first and a place that's safe because this is not a very uh, safe area out here. So we have to put them in sheltered waters and stuff. So the survey has been really good for all that. I just wanted to give you an idea. This is one of the projects we did last summer, this is actually one island. The one on the right goes down, continues down. It's just a big island. I couldn't get it all on here so you can see it. But we put the volunteers, you can see where we have them mostly in sheltered water. We had a, uh, some up here, up here working with kayaks. But the weather got pretty rough and they, didn't, they weren't able to get this. So we had to go back with our professional crew and get this. This area had been cleaned thoroughly in 2006 and we went back this year because our monitoring projects told us there's pretty good buildup of debris coming in there. So we went back with volunteers and hit it again this year. And you can see we picked up nine tons of trash, plastic, in just one weekend on these sites. Now that island there is 45, 50 miles away from any community. This is not local trash. This is almost close to 100%. I'd say 95% or greater is foreign debris or from offshore fisheries. This is just volunteers taking nets off one of those beaches. 
And that's our professional crew just locking down one of the loads to get ready to go back to port with it. I think last summer we hauled out, we only worked 55 days last summer, and we hauled out 11 loads like that. And those loads weigh about around five tons. Now, we have a very extensive marine debris monitoring project, and it's, it's going to be important because this uh, tsunami debris that's coming from Japan, because nobody had any baseline data other than our organization. We've been doing this now, I think, six years, but we have all these sites in Prince William Sound and three out on the Gulf at Gore Point. And it's really good for, are we looking at the rate of, of accumulation buildup? We're looking at the types of debris. Uh, we're looking at 135 categories of debris that we track. Um, it's really good for identifying spills that have happened out in the middle of the Pacific that you don't hear about. A uh, container ship goes over and then all two years later everything washes up on shore and we know it and we can see it on our monitoring sites. Those are our sites in Prince William Sound. Just to get these sites here, just to give you an idea how long it takes, these sites right here we, make, we do on one trip. That's about a 250 mile circuit and we usually take eight people out there and we'll spend at least a week probably doing all those sites. It's, it's, we clean up every single thing we can find on, a given, on this beach. We weigh it, we count it, we categorize it. We even go to the point of separating out the bottles and, and it, trying to identify them by country of origin. That's just uh, one of the monitoring sites and everybody's sitting there cataloging all the debris. It's, I just wanted, this is one of the sites we cleaned here uh, fall of 2010. I just wanted to point out that this site is only about 150 yards long and one winter 116 beverage bottles, new beverage bottles rolled up on that site. I think uh, 64 of them were from Asia that we could positively identify. Four of them were from North America, meaning they had English labels on them. And uh, the other 48 we couldn't identify, but I suspect most of those were Asian too. But we're trying to see if we can use these bottles as a proxy for the or origin of, of this debris. Of course, you know, there's all these drift issues. They're light bottles. They're up on top surface. They, they go in a different uh, pattern and the nets do, so it's pretty hard to lock that down, but we do, we are getting an idea where at least all the bottles are coming from. Uh, there's some real challenges this monitoring and, uh, you know, you, you got to figure out what it is, what it's made of, then you go to weigh it and you can imagine weighing a great big net that's full, it's wet and full of sand and what are you actually weighing here? Are you weighing plastic or are you weighing uh, the environment, you know? And you can weigh the same net that's completely dry and clean, you get totally different weights. So it's really hard to quantify this. And NOAA has been working over and over trying to get a standardized methodology for this monitoring work. But I just keep saying to them, good luck. But one thing that's come out of it, the debris we're picking up is the exact same stuff they're getting on Midway Island and points further uh, west. And it's, and it's coming from Asia, most of it. That's a calm day at Gore Point, by the way. And this is, I want to show you this. You know, we're supposed to categorize this stuff. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, that's a can of urethane foam that ruptured when it hit the beach. And so, what is it though? I mean, what category do we put that in? Is it plastic? Is it a toxic material? Is it steel? Or how do you weigh it, you know? And, it, and so you constantly have these issues that you're dealing with with this monitoring project. But, Hopefully, all in, the, in the end, it'll all work out in the wash. This is what I mentioned that we can find these uh, mid-ocean spills. This was a spill that showed up a couple years ago, and we started finding these pesticide bottles all up and down the coast, all the way from the inside of Prince William Sound all the way down to Gore Point. And somebody lost a container or a ship full of pesticides out there, and nobody, none of us heard about it. You know, so it was just a a toxic spill that went on and nobody's, nobody's taken uh, responsibility for the cleanup or the damage. Another issue is with monitoring, you know, you have to go through all these jillions of little bits of stuff and try and sort them out. You get these big tangles of rope, that, that big ball of rope and net there probably weighs 200 pounds and, and it's really difficult to sit there when it's pouring rain to 
pull that all apart and separate it out between crab line and long line and towing line and seine net and gill net and packing band and it's, it's nearly impossible actually. And then you, how do you weigh something like that? I mean, it's, you just can't do it. You just cut a chunk out of it and extrapolate. So you see all this stuff and you already sense that it's coming back and it's coming back and it's coming back, so why bother with it? Well, I'll tell you why I, I think we ought to bother with it. Other, other than aesthetics, I just can't stand the thought that that's my front yard. And I know how you'd feel if somebody came and dumped a truckload of plastic in your front yard, you'd be pretty pissed off about it. And you wouldn't let it sit there. Well, I don't think we should let it sit there. I think we should make an effort to clean it up. But there's, beyond that, there's some real practical reasons for doing it. This stuff is killing seabirds by the millions every year. This is off of the Midway Island, albatross chick. You know, so it's full of plastic when it dies. And so the scientists were saying, well, that doesn't mean the plastic killed them. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the next year they go back there. And they waited till this one died. And as soon as he died, they ran over there and cut him open. They counted 306 pieces of plastic in him, and his intestines are perforated from one end to the next. Of course it's killing them. I mean, look what that mother albatross fed that chick. Cigarette lighters, that pipe in the middle is a oyster culture steak that came from Indonesia probably. And you know, they're just, it's just killing them. And, and virtually every diving or feeding seabird they go out there and check has plastic in it. 35% of the fish they've sampled so far in the North Pacific have plastic in them. You know, they're all eating it. This is from the Northwest Straits Initiative in Puget Sound. They're doing a net, submerged net recovery uh, project. And that in the last six years, they've pulled out tons and tons of nets that are still fishing. They're snagged up underwater and fishing. And this is one net. These are dead seabirds. The seabirds go down there to get the fish that are trapped in the nets, and then the seabirds get caught. And a lot of these seabirds are threatened and endangered. So it's a big issue. And NOAA's really pushing hard now to go after these submerged nets. In the last six years, they pulled up 250 thousand dead animals in the nets they've recovered. Like over 200 species of animals have been killed by these nets. Just, just in that little area. And extrapolate, that, extrapolate that worldwide and you get an idea of what's going on. Uh, the entanglement, ingestion issues that you, I'm sure you've all heard about. Turtles eat plastic bags particularly because it looks like jellyfish. Of course it kills them. Whales, all the big marine mammals get entangled in it and drown. This is a stellar sea lion that has either rope or a packing band around its neck and it gets up there and it can't come back off because the hair is pointing this way so they get stuck on there and as the animal grows it just basically slowly guillotines them to death and that one's all abscessed up and I'm sure it's going to die. Uh, there's another stellar sea, lion, stellar sea lion and a ghost net that's just drifting out there. Also a shark in the upper part of that. Uh, this is a picture a friend of mine took out on the Privilos. He's, he's with the National a marine fishery service and uh, I think I, I can't remember the notes here. I look at this really quick. Uh, they say 0.4 percent of juvenile males aged two to three are entangled and once they're disentangled only 10 percent of those survive but there's a, they don't know why but the juvenile males they go out to sea and they get out in the convergence zone out in the Pacific and that's where they feed for quite a while and then they come back but they're not coming back and it's probably because they're going out there and doing this getting entangled in all that debris that's out there and uh, the fur seals are in trouble. The juvenile males are anyway. And it's not just entanglement and ingestion issues on out in the ocean but land mammals eat this stuff too and this is something nobody really pays attention to and something we've become aware of in the last few years Virtually every mammal that, you know, like the, especially the predators will eat that stuff. Coyotes and foxes and lynx, or not lynx, but uh, otters and everything. So they're all chewing on that stuff. Bears particularly love to chew on styrofoam. Now this is scat we've come across when we're cleaning. Um, this bear had a whole bunch of little pieces of red plastic in his scat. This is a coyote and that looks like bones. That's plastic that's in a scat. River otter, full of little chunks of yellow plastic, something he ate, looked colorful to him or something. Why they eat it, I don't know, but it can't be good for them. Our cleanup methodology is pretty damn simple. It's just 
labor, hard physical labor. We're working in sites where we can't drive to the beaches. We can't use four wheelers or six wheelers generally. Uh, you're just on the beach. You're using a shovel occasionally, not too often, but uh, plaskies and uh, chainsaw. Once in a while, come alongs and pry bars, and you know it's just hard, dirty work. That underneath that log, I went by there. I found a one float, and I started digging at it. Next thing you know, we'd pulled ten floats out of there. It's like a big giant turtle came along and laid a nest full of hard uh, trawl floats under there. This is a, a place out on Gore Point, out on the point. This is actually the ceiling of a cave. And the storms just drive this stuff up and jam it up in the rocks. And I think the storms actually lift the rocks up and then jam the stuff up and the rocks set down on them. But it was really dangerous working in there. We went, we'd take a big long pole and take a knife to the end of it, reach up in there and poke those things and they explode. Then, you know, rocks would come falling out and everything. We, we did the best we could. We finally decided it wasn't worth dying for. But there were two caves of it. Just, it looked like Lewis and Clark caverns or something, but made with uh, buoys. Uh, this just example of those big ship floats there. That thing probably weighed mm, six, 800 pounds. You can't handle it, obviously, so you have to cut them up in little pieces. And the only way you can really cut those up is a serrated knife. And, it, and it's hard work. Um, this shows the guys loading the boats. You know, you, you, you get all, pick up all the debris on the beach, you put it in garbage sacks, you load those in inflatable, bring them over to the other boats. It, quite often we can't get our landing craft to the beach for one reason or another, and so then you're moving this stuff by inflatable or into our small crew boat and then into the landing craft. And by the time you get in a dumpster, you've handled it five or six times. It's, it's just, it's just uh, tedious work. That's one of the many loads from last summer going back to port. I just wanted to kind of show you the sequence. We can take this landing craft. That's a 32-foot boat. Take it to town, put it on a triple axle trailer there, and we can pull it right up beside a 40-yard dumpster, one of those big construction dumpsters. And we'll take out all of the good floats, anything that's usable, like we find a lot of five-gallon drums and bigger than 30, 40, 50-gallon drums. Take all that stuff out, throw everything out in the dumpster, and it'll just fill it up. It's like a perfect load. Believe it or not, that three-wheeler was on a beach on a really remote island out there. It fell off of somebody's boat and the tires kept it afloat and wound up on a, on a remote island. And that just shows you how full the dumpsters are. But it, it's just grunt work is all it is. Except for the times <laughs> when we have so much debris and the conditions are so remote. And like this particular area, there was always so much surf here that we couldn't get a small landing craft in here and there was a tremendous amount of debris. So we resorted to helicopters to get it off in a big landing craft. That boat's 100 foot long and 20 feet wide and that's about 12 feet deep with garbage we picked off at just a few beaches right now. I just wanted to show you a before and after picture. This is kind of a typical little notch out there where the storms are driven the debris way up in there and you know that's what it looks like when we get done. You know, and one thing I want to point out here, you're looking at, what, 50, 60 years of, of plastic accumulation since dawn of plastic. It's been coming across Pacific. So we thought maybe we get this stuff cleaned up out there. We would have kind of a respite, but not working that way. It's coming in pretty darn fast. Where does it come from? Most of it probably on a worldwide basis is land-based land debris. It's coming out of you know, out of rivers, out of your gutter, out of your cars, blown offshore. This happens to be a dump up along the coast of western Alaska. And of course now with global warming, there's no sea ice in the wintertime, so the storms are taking out their shoreline. Their dump's going to be in the ocean here pretty quick, and somebody's going to be picking that up. But a lot of it comes from these mid-ocean accidents and blown off of boats or people purposely throwing it away. Um, this is that recent one that went, the one in the lower right hand corner is that big transport ship that went up on the side of New Zealand. And, but you know, they were able to get most of those uh, containers, those are semi-containers on those things. They got most of those off, but these other boats are out in the middle the ocean. They go down, they're gone. And a lot of those containers have hazardous material in them. Anything you can imagine is in those containers. And if it's in real deep water, it'll probably go down far enough so that it'll get crushed and maybe the stuff won't come up, but if it's not too deep, 
eventually they're going to rust and stuff's going to come out. And this plastic, it's going to it's going to come out again. Uh, this is a pretty cool little thing. This shows the surface currents. Let's see if I can make this work. There you go. This is a 14-year time loop and and done by the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, and it, they've done surface temperatures and wave height or sea, or sea height and they can tell which way the currents are going. But I wanted to show, people wanted, were saying, how can you get tra trash out of Asia where you can see all this mixing over here and every once in a while some will shoot out this way then it gets into these currents along the coast of Japan, works out here in the convergence zone. This is Hawaii. This is where that great big garbage patch of debris, Texas sized patch of debris is, is out in this area. So this stuff is coming out here and will eventually wind up in here, a lot of it. But, let's see if I can go to the next one here. This is again a Hawaii down here. And this is what we call the Pineapple Express. In the wintertime we get these great big storms that last for days if not weeks on end that blow right up from Hawaii. They originate down in this area and they blow right up into the Gulf of Alaska. So you have that garbage patch out here. And it's blown across it. And anything that has a high wind sail, like an empty bottle or a big block of styrofoam or even these floats, is going to go right straight north or northwest. And this just to show you our monitoring sites. This is the total weight of debris off our monitoring sites each of those four years along the bottom. This is uh, the 2007-2008 year. I wanted to show you here how much debris there was. But look at, these are storms, not the Pineapple Express, these are just local storms and they track them this way and the darker red they are, the high, higher intensity storms they are. And so they're pulling this debris up out of the ocean and then in the, that's coming out across from Asia and driving it up into this direction. And this is a year, I think it's the next year, 2009, yeah, and you can see the storms are much weaker. They don't come up here into the Gulf of Alaska where they're going to get trapped in the Alaska current. And they don't deliver. We can sit and look at this in the spring and we know what we're going to find on our monitoring sites as far as volume before we go out there. Um, now you have these uh, storms coming up here I just showed you about. Well this is Alaska coastal current. So if this debris gets up in here and then it gets driven by this Alaska coastal current that's retrograde and it jams all this stuff up in here. So that's why these beaches right in here are probably among the dirtiest beaches in the world, a place you would think there'd be virtually no trash or absolutely filthy. So we get debris from everywhere. Now why we're getting debris from the United Arab Emirates, the only thing I can imagine is that they have some flag vessels and they're dumping their garbage in the ocean. But we get it from everywhere. That's just off that one monitoring site I showed you. It had all the bottles on it from Asia, but it's not just bottles. It's every damn thing. It's got Asian writing on it. And I just want to point this out. This is a cleanup we did in 2008, or part of a cleanup. This is just ahead of Tonsina Bay where the guys had stashed the debris from that area. Well, we went back this summer. And that's how much more came in in three years. It's not nearly as much, but it's a significant amount. Now that last pile was 40 years of accumulation. This is only three years of accumulation. So it's a pretty, pretty sad situation. Go, of course, the, the nets. The nets are probably our biggest problem. They're hard to work with, hard to handle, weigh a lot, take up a lot of space in the boats. And they're, they're everywhere. I mean, last summer we I, I sampled 100, or we sampled 176 nets. We take out samples and we send them off and they're categorizing and we're trying to figure out the country of origin, the manufacturers of them, and maybe even the fisheries. So if someday people are going to, hoping they can assess Blaine and get some uh, uh, money out of those people for cleanups. Gosh darn it. This is just uh, another thing we get, a lot of big ropes. That, line there is probably eight inches in diameter. It's a tow rope for a big barge or something. There's one of those on the outside of Montague Island. It's probably half a mile long. It's still laying on the beach. But it gets, you have this branch that's sticking out into the, the coastal current. The current runs along the coast and when the tide is up and anything goes by there it gets snagged on these big logs and they just make a hell of a mess. But 
Uh, that's a local gill net. Uh, we don't find a lot of those. Those guys are usually pretty good about cleaning up their stuff. And of course, those nets are horribly expensive and they don't want to lose them. And some, but sometimes their boats go down or whatever. A lot, lot of line, that's uh, crab line, long line from the commercial fisheries. Then there's all kinds of commercial fishing debris that you find out. You know, a commercial fishing boat goes down and all the debris comes off. They're, eventually the boat breaks apart and all that styrofoam and insulation in their freezers comes out and you find crap all over the place. You microwaves and TVs and computers and, and lots of refrigerators and coolers. And these, most of these long skinny floats, those are called uh, banana floats. They're high seas drift net floats. Uh, you've probably all heard about the high seas drift nets that have been uh, outlawed, but you can see some of those floats are pretty new, so they're still doing it. Packing bands. I, did, I could never figure out where all this material was coming from. It turns out it's commercial fishing debris, and all those big factory processors use packing bands to bind up their boxes. And so they'll lose a spool overboard, and then animals get tangled in it, killed. It's probably the dead, deadliest of all material out there, particularly to seals and sea lions, because they, they have the, the bands that are loops, and they'll, they go through them playing with them, and then they get over their body, and then they're done, they're screwed. Styrofoam. It is a time-consuming son of a gun, and it's, we have unbelievable amounts of styrofoam. And when I was at a conference last year, there was a display there that some folks from China put up, and it showed the mouth of one of their rivers, and these big blocks of styrofoam are all over the mouths of their rivers. Now, why, I don't know, but they're there. And if you remember that current loop I showed you, they're getting here to Alaska, for crying out loud. And, it, and a lot of it's local. I mean, it's used for docks. It's used a lot in the commercial fisheries. But the problem is with that stuff, it eventually breaks down into little tiny pieces, and it's really hard to clean up. And not only that, it, it's full of phthalates. Phthalates are a plasticizer to make plastic spongy and flexible and, and flexible. And they're, dead, and they're pretty nasty. We'll go into that later. I just want to show you, it, we have more styrofoam there. People look at this and they go, whoa, where's all that styrofoam coming from? Well, I'm convinced it's because of the way the currents and the winds are running. This little cave, and this shows you how things segregate beach by beach too. This little cave had 32 bags of styrofoam in it by the time they got done cleaning it up. I just want, and this picture on the left is what bears, bears love styrofoam. They chew it all up, spread it all over. Black bears primarily, and we haven't noticed that with brown bears, but then if you look closely there, you'll see after it's been cleaned up, see all the little white speckles in here? It's just styrofoam crumbs everywhere, so you've left a lot of, a lot of plastics behind, even, even as nice as that look. Something unique to Prince William Sound is all their uh, PVC piping that came from a hatchery that blew out years ago. That's a 40-foot chunk of pipe. It's 12-foot in diameter, and it's plumb full of styrofoam. And, We've been finding them for 300 miles up and down the coast. That's one winter of bottle accumulations on a monitoring site out of Gore Point. Bottles are a huge problem. Lots of hydrocarbon products everywhere, contaminating everything. This last summer, this stuff on the left there started showing up, big globs of grease, uh, some kind of spill out in the ocean, and, and we found it all up and down the damn coastline. Toxic material, that's a creosote log there. Look what it's done to the forest floor. And we don't do anything with those. We just don't have the capacity to handle them. We're getting more recreational debris in Prince William Sound all the time. Shotgun shells and wads. When I was a kid, those things were paper. There's no reason why they can't be paper now. Instead, we're out blasting plastic all around the place. A lot of legacy cruise ship debris still to this day. This, you know, the cruise ships haven't been throwing their garbage away for 20 years or something, but it's still out there on the beaches and we're still picking it up. This is the odd one. We find a lot of pharmaceuticals and a lot of them are from Russia. Uh, we can't identify them. Just an oddity. And then, of course, all the fishing floats from all the big offshore. Another thing, Prince William Sound, there's a tremendous amount of waste left from the Exxon Valdez oil spill still. These are all absorbance of one sort or another to soak up the oil, but then they got churned up into the beaches by the storms and they're still there and they're still full of oil. Big bundles of fabric we found now. This, see the dog sitting there? 
blends right in. He adapted, he evolved very quickly to that fabric. <laughs> um, I don't know what they're for. Some, you know, probably a spill out middle ocean of some fabric going. And then of course the famous three wheeler that showed up out there on Lone Island. We do find survival gear and when you find that or you find boat parts, you know somebody was in trouble. It's not a good feeling when you find that stuff. So far we have not found any body parts. That one had a stash of marijuana and a pot pipe rolled up in it. <laughs> and he was going to die happy, I guess. I think that's Natalie's finger. I found that. You found that? <laughs> now, we find a lot of toys and a lot of athletic uh, equipment. That's disturbing, isn't it? And I, and I look at that and I think, this is what we're doing to ourselves. We don't get to recycle much of it. It's too costly to ship it. It's too time consuming to sort it out. And a lot of it's dirty and they don't want it. Uh, we try to give all the floats back to commercial fishermen or to local communities because a lot of artists use them and they do different things with them. That float uh, Sean there found out on the beach and I thought, man, kind of like a guy that has a dog starts looking like his dog after a while. He's starting to look like marine debris. <laughs> Just some of the goodies we find, you know, floats. And there's not a lot. People ask us if we're finding anything really cool. You know, the floats are always cool to find. I just want to point out this thing down in the lower corner here. Anybody know what that is? It's a stamp out for our soles for flip flops. And we find bundles of that all over the place. I don't understand where they're coming from. It looks like somebody actually bundled them up to recycle them, and then they got out in the ocean and said, hell with it, threw them out, you know. But they're all over the place. And most of these pictures that we see are taken when nice sunny days. Well, it's not like that most of the time out there. This is not a walk in the park. It's hard, it's hard physically demanding work and it's dangerous too. You know, you're walking on wet, slick beaches, slip loose logs, and you know, it's, it's just grunt work. And that load right there probably weighed 150 pounds and you packed it probably half a mile like that. Sometimes you have to do it. These guys are cleaning out a uh, net that was blocking an estuary where uh, silver salmon spawn. Pulling nets off these beach. These, be these nets have a lead line in the bottom of them to keep them so they, they'll hold, hang like a curtain. So they're really heavy. Of course, this has got nylon, real fine nylon webbing so they snags on everything. They're just really hard to deal with these things. Taken under, that was a huge net that went on for hundreds of yards along that beach and we spent a lot of time trying to get a lot of it out but we probably only got a quarter of it. And then you're walking across that stuff all day long, it, it's tough work. That rope took eight people an entire day to dig out of the beach. It probably weighed close to a ton when we got it all out of there and bagged up. There were 30 bags, big bags of, of line in that thing. Again, we're back to the floats. They have to be sectioned up and packed out. Each one of those sections probably weighs 150 pounds on that one, and that's a small one. And you got to load it all in the boat. Got to, you know, pack all these stage bags in there, and somebody's down in the bottom of the boat and the whole sort stacking things under there, cramming them in there to maximize everything. And then off you go to port. Boat load after boat load after boat load. That one, the the boat broke down, had an engine failure, and they had to tow it 75 miles, so they just put everything possible they could on that load, and you can see they could <laughs> up on the roof and everything else, but then there's problem, you know, you're dealing with bears, a lot of black bears, and we're out there working in the spring when the bears have come out of their dens, and they have cubs, and they're hungry, and it's, so you got to be aware of them all the time. we got brown bears out on the Montague Coast and some of the other spots out there, and this was one that was around one of our cleanups a couple years ago. Not a place you want to turn volunteers loose. Then there's always the surf conditions. I mean, it can just get nasty really, really fast. Got to deal with that. High winds. This storm hit probably 100 miles an hour, and the guys were stuck in it for like 12 days. And then there's this constant rain and cold temperatures. It's probably 50 degrees and drizzling rain, if not driving rain. And, and it, so after a couple months of doing that, that's what these guys look like. <laughs> they, they go to seed. <laughs> All right, so just kind of running short on time already here, aren't we? How are we doing, Natalie? We're doing good. 
All right. I'm a quarter of the way done. <laughs> I just want to go over Gore Point a little bit here. This is a really massive undertaking and it opened a lot of eyes about how serious. Again, I'll just point out where that is to you. We're uh, way down here on the south, southwest end or south southern end of the Kenai Peninsula. And this, we'll talk about that little spot here late in a couple minutes. This is a massive undertaking. That's the east beach at Gore Point where a, a great deal of debris was. Most of the debris was up in this forest. So as much as 100, 150 yards back in the trees where the storm driven it. This is the west beach where some idiot, and this guy was truly an idiot because he's wrecked a lot of boats and he's left a lot of them behind, but he's left it on the beach here. Big boat, big commercial boat. This is a wilderness. This Kachemak Bay State Wilderness Park, and I got a boat sitting in the middle of it. This is the North Beach. You can see all those little white specks all the way up around the corner. Those are bags full of garbage as far as you can see. We spent uh, 56 days out here cleaning up this mess. And this is before they started cleaning. You can kind of see some of the debris in those logs. You don't see most of it. You just see some of the bigger colorful items. That's the crew, kind of give you a scale of what it's like out there. Those logs on the, the far end of that beach there are 12, 15 feet high, deep, and debris all the way down through it. So this is after they got it clean, and I was looking at this thing, and I noticed that somebody was really happy they were done because he's doing a cartwheel out there. <laughs> and then they cleaned the forest, and this is the forest floor back there off the beach, and they spent weeks and weeks in here cleaning this mess up. And that's after they got it clean. You can see how the vegetation was all compacted and prevented from growing by all the, the plastic that was in there. But even then, once they got it clean, you can see all the little styrofoam bits everywhere. You, you just can't get rid of it. It's, it's a legacy to be there forever. Another big ship fender had to be cut up because we, this place here we couldn't do with our small landing craft. We had to get a big commercial landing craft out there in a helicopter. So we had to get everything staged for the helicopter to sling it off. And they were able to come right down through all those trees with a drop line and snake all that stuff up. But all this stuff had to be put in super sacks before the helicopter could lift it. And then they lifted it off the beaches or out of the trees and dropped it on the landing craft. That's that landing craft I showed you earlier. This is the process of emptying all this. Once we got the, that landing craft back to port, it took us a couple days to unload it. We didn't want to just throw it, all this stuff away because those super sacks are worth 35 bucks a piece and they're like 250 of them or something. So that's a pretty good chunk of money that we want to get back. So we set this up where they put all the super sacks up on that middle dumpster up there in the upper left hand corner on a platform and then we dumped them all into these 40 yard dumpsters and then down here in this corner you can see this as we dumped them, the local artists were in there slicing all the bags open and getting all the usable floats and goodies that they could find, which was pretty nice. We appreciated them doing that. So Gore Point, a lot of volunteer hours. Just imagine 2,200 garbage bags full of plastic. And they're not the little ones, they're the big ones, you know. And Unbelievable amount of money, but, or uh, debris. But we took 45 tons of plastic out of that area in two months. Most of it, 25 tons, just from that half mile East Beach. The sad thing is, we got done on a Friday night, took everything to Homer, unloaded the landing craft. I had to come back and take the boats all the way back to Whittier, so I got to Gore Point and stayed overnight. Sunday night, I walked out on the beach. Monday morning, first 30 feet, I found 18 new bottles. This is, uh, we set that up as a monitoring site. We got it in 13, I think, 100 yard sections. And this is what was on one section the next spring. So it's, not, it's common to find thousands of pounds of trash out there every spring, new stuff. But we, if we pick it up before it gets off the beach and in the trees, it's much better to deal with. Elizabeth Island's a pretty unique little spot. It's way down on the um, south end of the Kenai Peninsula, way down here. Um, there's Homer. about. 45 miles from Homer. This is Cook Inlet here. Cook Inlet has a tidal range of 42 feet. So there's tremendous tides that run in and out of there. A lot of coastal current, a lot of storms. It's, it's a pretty tough place to work. We, the storms had 
blowing all this debris. This is the prevailing storm f from this direction. They're blowing all the debris up over this beach and into this lake. And in the backside of this lake, there's a big log berm. You can see the logs. That's all logs there, that silver stuff, way back up in here. And so the debris all gets tossed up over here and in the lake. And the whole bottom of the lake's full of nets, and those logs are all full. And that's all floating. That's just an aerial view from the beachfront to see what's going on here. This is the guys starting to the cleanup. And you can see that big bluff there that stuff had to go over the top of. And that's what the bluff was like in the vegetation, just packed full of debris. And then up in the lake, they're just getting there looking at this going, oh, Christ, are we really going to do this? But that's what the logs were like. And now this is a salmon spawning stream. There's at least three species of salmon in here. And there's a nice spawning stream above the lake. But of course, it was virtually blocked off by all these nets that intertwined through all the logs. And they couldn't get, to get in there. So we have gone back. We, we cleaned this originally two years ago. And we recleaned it again this summer. And I think we now have it pretty clean. But, but not only were the logs full of nets, but the logs were out in the middle of the lake. That's one big net we hauled off the bottom of the lake. We spent a couple of days doing that this summer. And this is probably 100, year, 100 yards beyond the lake. So now we're talking a half a mile from the, from the beach. There's still debris. And that's how far those storms would carry that stuff back in there. This is the guys working in that log berm. Now understand, this is all floating. A lot of them took baths they didn't want to take. And they just worked for days and days and days in there. There's one of those bundles of uh, flip-flop things there. Hard work, and that's one of those gill nets, and of course it's wrapped around every single thing down there, and there's been hours and hours getting that stuff out. There's no way salmon can get by that stuff when it's all woven through those logs. So the process, just get in there and move the logs around and cut them loose. You know, you're in <laughs> chest waders. Tow it out with an inflatable to a point where you can then load it in an inflatable, take it across the lake. Get it to the other side of the lake, and then you have to haul it down to the beach, which is another three or four hundred yards. By the time you get done with this, you've handled everything about five times, and it's just a tremendous amount of work. This is some of the debris that we staged out on that beachfront before the landing craft came back to get it all. But as bad as all that big stuff is, you get in between the logs, and this is what you're looking at. The logs are churning around the storms, and they're grinding all that plastic up, and it's just billions of pieces of plastic floating around in there. And you can't hope to get it all. These are nurdles. They're feedstock for plastic manufacturing. You, they get big super sacks full of that stuff. And they ship it all around the world. And they'll take it to a plant. And they'll turn it into, you know, I don't know, a TV or whatever. Or, or some, something made out of plastic. But these things are everywhere. And that lake is full of those damn nurdles. And there's not a nurdle manufa manufacturer or source within probably 5,000 miles of this place. But they're coming all across the ocean, and they're stacking up. Of course, the fish eat those things. Probably the worst problem is all the chemicals. You know, you think of a bottle that falls in the ocean. It's full of something. If it's plastic, it's not going to rupture until it hits the shore. And then when it hits the shore, all that crap goes on the shore. So we find bleach and detergents and hydrocarbons and whatever. And all of it's dumping on the shoreline, right in that rich inner tidal zone where things are spawning. And this is the the sheen or scum that's in those logs where all that crap has been just piling up over the years. And it, that lake is really toxic. So what are we doing in the future? You all know about the tsunami. That's all coming to a beach near you pretty soon. This is Noah's model with no windage in it. They figured all of it was going to go over to the west coast, but now they're putting a windage factor in it, and it's curving, and it's going to come right up in the Gulf of Alaska, and we're going to get buried with it. There's still one to two million tons of float out there a year later. And if we get 1% of that in Alaska, that's going to be 20 to 40 million pounds on our beaches. In the last 10 years, all of us in Alaska working have cleaned up about 2 million pounds. So it's going to be overwhelming. And if you think about what's in your garage or under your kitchen sink or under your bathroom sink, all the chemicals, think of all those houses, what were in those houses and factories and industrial plants and everything else and garage stations in Japan. And all those containers of stuff are afloat. I bet you there are millions of containers full of chemicals floating out there. And they're all going to come ashore at some point. 
I love this picture. This artist did this. It's not what you see on top. That's the big issue. It's all these chemicals that we can't see that are really what's important. I mean, we're just doing the superficial stuff. We are now working with the College of William and Mary and the University of Elastic Anchorage to look at the toxicity of this plastic. You know, of course, plastic has all its own inherent chemicals, but then, as I mentioned earlier, it absorbs a lot of these industrial pollutants and brings it to a shore near you. This is crushed up styrofoam in a salmon spawning stream. The stuff is just loaded with phthalates. Now I hear that oh, phthalate, and I thought phthalate was one type of additive to, to plastic. Well, it turns out there's a jillion different varieties of it, but there's 25, at least 25 common phthalates. Uh, UAA and College William Mary are looking at, I think, six phthalates. One, they're doing immune studies in fish, see what the phthalates do to the, the fish immune system. Uh, take a bunch of tissue samples, that's just a spleen sample out of a sockeye salmon. And, and by the way, if you like to eat raw sockeye salmon, don't. Those are worms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you want to look at that again? <laughs> every, one, every adult rod salmon I open up is full of worms, and they do have worms that can penetrate your gut. So I would never eat them raw. I eat them cooked. <laughs> um, Dr. Kennish at UAA is looking at uh, a lot of different chemicals from plastic, trying to see, quantify how much of it's actually getting into the, the biosphere. And they're, they're focusing on phthalates right now. Phthalates are practically all plastics, and we're feeding them to our kids. Every one of us have plastics in our body. Hell, it's in nail polish. But this is what it, this is what it does to humans, they know already. And it's pervasive in the, the marine environment. So they're looking at six phthalates and four trophic levels, clams, halibut, coal, salmon, and tufted puffins. And some of this stuff, according to Dr. Kennish, is toxic at a half a part per billion. Well, you add all these up. And we're way beyond that. Uh, Dr. Zwallow at U of uh, William and Mary is working on the immune system stuff. Uh, and she's been adding little uh, solutions of phthalates or concentrations of phthalates to tissue cultures and then watching the cells die, which they do right away. And, and certainly is, uh, this is just preliminary stuff, but it's pretty scary. And this is just one phthalate when you have. 25 common ones out there, and they're all working together. You can imagine what's going on. Um, just quickly, are some future projects we're going to be working on. We got this large grant from the Exxon Valdez Oisville Trustee Council that's going to allow us to do three pretty, pretty interesting projects, and, we, and it's also going to allow us to do some more research projects. Next summer, we're going to do a little cleanup in the corner of Prince William Sound, or this coming summer. And then we're going to go out in this northern gulf area here. This is going to require helicopters because there's no secure place to put our boats here in the open gulf. And this is Kenai Fjords National Park. We're going to try and finish cleaning all that this summer. And then uh, I wanted to point out sea lions are endangered. There's a major sea lion rookery down here on the end of this uh, Kenai Fjords uh, cleanup project. And there's a vessel exclusion zone around here. It's about two miles radius probably so and that's in Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge so we're going to have some access problems we're trying to work that out right now but those beaches are really dirty and sea lions get entangled in this stuff and you think okay once it's on the beach who cares but a big storm comes along and rips it off the beach and it's out there floating again uh, they don't stay put those nets uh, 2013 we're going out in the Barren Islands this is really going to be a challenging project. This is Gore Point. This is Elizabeth Island. So we're about 25 miles out across open water to this area. Tremendous currents, a lot of storms out there, but also a hell of a lot of garbage. And there's two lakes here that have the same situation as Elizabeth Island, but they're much bigger. And so we hope we can get all that done in one summer. I don't know if it's possible, but we're going to give it a try. That just gives you a, a closer idea or a better view maybe if but you can see there's, that's all log jam along this big lake here. And I'm sure it's completely full of plastic and ropes. And then uh, 2014, we're going out in Montague Island. Montague Island is the biggest island in Prince William Sound. It's about 50 miles long from here to there and maybe eight miles wide. But the whole outside of it faces the Gulf of Alaska and the prevailing currents and the prevailing winds. 
and it is 70 miles if you measure around all these convolutions here of debris covered beach and we estimate there's at least 300 tons of plastic out there and that's particular and we're just going to do 10 to 15 miles of it as much as we can do in one summer but we won't be able to do this out of our boats we're going to have to put people on shore with uh, float planes wheel planes and going to have to live in man camps out there there's just no way for us to keep our boats out there for the guys to stay on and that's what the shoreline of Montague looks like it's 70 miles of log jams it's plumb full of garbage this is up further toward the north where the beaches are a little steep. Well, I wanted to point out one thing. Uh, the 1964 quake raised Montague Island 37 feet. So you see all these logs down in here in the trees, right in here? That's the 1964 uh, pre-quake shoreline. So any, that will have pre-64 plastic in it. This is the shoreline now. And you can see even out of the airplane, how much debris is in that thing. And of course, that's a big chunk of marine debris there. That must be for me. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> oh, that's Dr. Kenny from UAA. Should I get him on a speakerphone? I thought about turning it off and I forgot. We have uh, part of our EVOS grants going to give us some research money to buy a submersible ROV to go look for submerged nets. And NOAA is probably more interested in this than anything else because it's killing so much wildlife. They continue to fish. It's just destroying all kinds of stuff. This little ROV we're going to get only weighs about 10 pounds, but it, it has forward and back and up and down sideways thrusters on it. It can go down 1,000 feet deep. It knows exactly where it is because it can measure where it is through the cable. It'll give you a GPS coordinate of whatever you see down there in the bottom, and that's a coordinate directly above it on the surface of the water. It's pretty amazing technology, but it's really expensive. It's like $100,000 for that thing. So we're going to run two pilot projects around areas that we know have really intensive commercial fishing effort for a long time and, it, and test it out, see how well we can see the nets. It has a, a blue view sonar on it that's actually sonar Unbelievable. Would you turn that off for me, Cody? <laughs> Say, John, I'll call you right back. <laughs> um, but this blue view sonar, you can tune it to see plastic and you can see net webbing. So that's why it's so expensive. I just love this picture. It says a lot about this is out there in the Gore Point region. You know, while, you know, it's uh, in the wilderness area and you got this big rope tangled up around this tree choking it to death and it's just like it's, it's a beautiful picture but it just says a lot about how things are. Um, that's just a list of all of our sponsors. Not much there. Question time. Anybody have whiplash? <laughs> Are you concerned for the health of the people that are contacting all this debris? Are you? Yeah, we, we are. But you can't get guys to wear gloves. <laughs> you know, it's difficult to work with gloves, and when you're picking up those little bits of styrofoam, you can't do it with a heavy glove, and if you put on something like a light glove, so they're constantly getting exposed to phthalates, especially when they're dealing with all that styrofoam. There's no question about it. But I don't know. I don't know how much of a concern it is. You know, they eat it. They eat the fish. It's in all your fish. Everybody thinks Alaska fish is clean. It's not. You didn't hear me say that, though. <laughs> you? Are you generating any positive revenue from the materials? No, we have not. And we. We probably cut off of those floats because some of those big midwater trawl floats are worth two or three hundred bucks a piece, and even the small ones like that are forty, fifty bucks, and we find thousands of them. But we have to have a place to store them. We have to have a way to sort them out. We have to figure out which ones are not cracked and everything else, and then get them back to the right fisheries. So what we do is just a community outreach is give them back, and then we can pick them up a couple years later. Go ahead. Have you considered trying to use preventative filtering? Of 
lot of people have looked at that, and it's just, it's such a vast area, they, it's just no way of doing it. And they've looked at the cost, they've looked at different technologies, they talk about going out to garbage patch and saning it all up, trawling it all up, and when you're talking a place that's the size of Texas, just in the garbage patch, plus it's not just on the surface, it's 2,000 feet down, there's plastic floating around. There's no way. Are there any other organizations like yours working on there are. Uh, we're, we're pretty unique in that we're the only outfits that really does it professionally and that we do remote cleanups like that off of boats. There's a lot of cleanups that are based close to communities, and, but nothing like we do. And they've been trying to get us to export our model, but it doesn't work too well. How much time do you spend uh, trying to obtain grants? A lot of time. And it, it, you know, it's not just writing grants, it's also all the reports and all the bureaucratic hassle you have to go through. You know, we, we've been criticized for taking money from BP, Princess Tours, Alaska Pipeline, which is one of the, the oil company up in Alaska. Um, people think we shouldn't take money from those people, but my take on it is we're all responsible for it. I don't care if people are giving, I don't care what people do. If they want to help us clean up beaches, that's fine. As long as they're not dumping garbage on the beach, I'll take their money. But the reason why I say that, get money from BP and Exxon, well, not Exxon. They won't even talk to us. Cleaning beaches, they don't want to be associated with that. But from BP and Alaska and Princess Tours, they give you money. They see the product you're selling. They give you money. They don't ask for anything. We don't have to do a bunch of reporting or anything else. We just go do the work. So it's really nice. The, I'm not bad-mouthing the government. I understand they have to do all their accounting and everything else, but it's really difficult for an organization like ours. We don't have any paid staff. It's all volunteer. And every year I probably spend, I don't know, a couple thousand hours on this stuff. Once you have all the trash for shore and collected, where does it go? We take it to, to port, and then it goes in those dumpsters. The ones that go in the dumpsters, and those dumpsters are loaded on a truck and hauled to the landfill in Anchorage. And every time we bring in one of those dumpsters, it costs us a thousand bucks. And when we take it to Homer or Seward, it goes to the Seward landfill. They don't charge us. It's really nice. They don't charge us for the deposition, but we get charged for the hauling. How much fuel do you use this summer? I think last summer we probably used twenty thousand dollars worth of fuel, something like that. But we, you know, we go on those long-range trips like that. We're going slow. We could go a lot faster and burn four times as much fuel. We'll spend, it takes us two days to get to Gore Point, where if we got the boat on stuff, you could run down there in 10 hours or something probably, but you would be out of fuel when you got there. So we, we really conserve the fuel, but it, it costs us some time. Do you work with other groups or advocate just using less plastic and trying to keep it out of the oceans to begin with? Yeah, we do, and, and we, I didn't go into it here, but we, we have a big public outreach program that's being funded and it's going to have a curriculum. Other groups are working on that as subcontractors for us. There's going to be a film on marine debris that they're producing and a bunch of stuff. And yeah, we do. We work as much as we can. But we're pretty remote, out of sight up there. Um, we did go to the International Marine Debris Convention last March and, and made a lot of connection. It's good. But man, it's a big problem. Follow up on um, the little stuff that you leave behind that, that really does bother me. Is there any technology or anything you've come across that might get the little stuff? You know, the resource agencies don't want us to, re to mess with the soils. They don't want us removing the fines or whatever. So it's, it's a problem. And particularly like at Gore Point, that is a an ancient native community site there where it was occupied for thousands of years. There's remnant pit homes there, and so they don't want you doing any digging. We do get the nets out. We, in the surf zone, we do. Uh, but as far as getting all those little tiny, there's billions of those things out of there. And, and you could float them, but you'd also float all the twigs and everything else, and you'd have, you know, it, it, it's impossible. It'd be, it just cost an absolute fortune. We like to get started around the first part of May, but toward the end of August, the weather starts turning over there and the storms start coming up and it's really difficult to work out on the coast. And we can still work in Prince William Sound probably into October, 
with this net, the submerged net program. We're planning on working probably a couple months more in a year. In the summertime, our water is so rich and so full of organic material that's going to be really hard to see. So we're going to need to do that in early spring and late fall when we, we have some weather to do that. But basically, it's three to four months. So the guys that we have, they come back every year. And they, they work their asses off all summer long. And then they go school or go skiing or whatever, you know. Have any environmental law groups uh, near you? I've been here Nobody's contacted us. You know, I've been pushing really hard for accountability just as much as I can, but nobody's uh, talked to us at all about it. And it's tough. It's tough to assess blame for this stuff. I mean, one thing I've been advocating is that right now, if, if a shipper loses a whole load of his uh, containers out in the middle ocean, the only communication that's going on is between his, he and his insurer. And I think there ought to be an international treaty to make those guys divulge exactly what they lost. And then both the shipper and insurer should divulge that information. So we start getting a handle on that. Because with all that crap being dumped out in the ocean, somebody's got to clean it up, which is the taxpayer. So the costs aren't being internalized. So what you pay for, when you go buy a product in a store, the true cost of it's not reflected in what you're buying. And, it, and it's, it's a really bad way to do things. I mean, if we're, I can't imagine what it truly costs to clean this up. We're talking trillions of dollars. I, I personally, personally think that this problem is right below global warming and environmental uh, problems. It, it's a very serious problem, and it's global. Could you talk a little bit more about your volunteers? We have a really large volunteer workforce. So who are they, and what is motivating them to go out and do this groundwork over and over for a problem that keeps them Seems intractable. Well, there's a lot of people in Alaska that absolutely love Prince William Sound. And it, as you can see, it's, in a, it's a beautiful place. And they love the outdoors. And we have people that have come out 10 years in a row with us to do this. And we have some really good people. Anthony Fowler, for one, she organizes a bunch of them and, and, the, and the charter captains. And it's just people that truly love the place. And they love that. It's fun. It's beachcombing. It really is, it is fun until you start doing an industrial effort and then it breaks your back and pulls your shoulders apart and everything else, as my sons can attest. But they're, uh, and the, the volunteer cleanup is really a public outreach thing. But if we use it right, it's also very productive for us. But it takes a tremendous amount of organization as you can manage to get all those people on boats and get them out there and, and deal with the weather and everything else. It's like. It, it's a complicated issue. It takes me a lot of time to get that done. Has this made you view plastic differently in your life? What's that? Has, has it made you view plastic differently in your life? Or do view you it or use it? Both. <laughs> uh, I tell you, I start, no, you can't get away from it as much as you'd like to. And I, I'll get a bottle just run of those like that bottle she has right there and I'll use it for two years straight. People tell me I'm nuts, you know, but <laughs> I just don't, I try not to buy that kind of stuff, but it's really hard to avoid it. It's just so freaking convenient. And until we realize how bad it is for us, I don't think it's going to change much. It's so cheap and so easy to use. What kind of art uh, are they making from this garbage and debris? Have you seen much? And um, can you access? What kind of art? Yeah, what kind of art? You mentioned that these guys were picking through the garbage. Well, you know, artists, they'll do about anything. Um, they're making, there's one lady that's making really great big sculptures. She's got a great big bird she's made out of it. It's just freestanding thing. It's like 12 feet across or something. And that's kind of traveling around. There's, there's a bunch of them now that are getting a big exhibit up, and they're, it's going to go all around the country. Part of what we're going to fund in this public outreach is uh, they're going to make, they're going to build panels that are like eight feet, six by eight or something like that, and have all the debris from a particular beach suspended in it in some kind of design. And they're going to link all these panels so they make a great big gyre, and you can just kind of walk through it. And it's going to be transportable, and they're going to move it all around the country. And, you know, 
I'm not an artist. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm just wondering if maybe this question has been answered already, but there must be certain manufacturers of plastic bottles that might have an interest in this thing. If you could push their button somehow and show them all these bottles laying around on the beaches, maybe they'd contribute to some sort of help cleaning up. We were at the, when we were at the international conference last spring, they had a representative from DuPont there. And actually, you know, I was pretty impressed. And they said, listen, this stuff's all recyclable. We want it recycled. But we just got to figure out a way to do it. But then when you say the best way to do it is internalize the cost, that means put a dollar bottle deposit on every plastic bottle and it would come back. People wouldn't throw it in the road anymore. But the American Chemical Council, who was also at that conference, is kind of like having the American Tobacco Institute at a can cancer conference. <laughs> There's, no, they fight. Anytime you talk about having a bottle deposit law, they fight it tooth and nail. They don't want it. You know, and, it, and it's all about money. All about money. And I'm, I'm cynical. I'm sorry. You talk about those plastics having a million times more toxins on them. Have there any issues with recycling that? What about it? The bottles you say have a million times more toxins on them? Well, it's mostly the, the floats. But whatever, you know, the plastic items. Yeah, it could be the bottles too. Do you recycle that or is there? Well, we recycle it. it well, they would, because nobody's testing those surfaces, but we don't recycle any of it. But there's a lot of places that do. So that's a good question, you know, because that stuff's coming right back out into the recycled products, probably. I don't know if it gets hot enough when they recycle it to destroy that stuff. I have no idea. Um, when you come across an animal that's suffering from some kind of plastic, what do you do, or is there anything that you can do? We can't really do anything. First place, you can't deal with marine mammals unless you have a taking permit, which is tough to get. And we have permits to pick up. We pick up carcasses that we bring back to Fish and Wildlife Service, like otter carcasses and eagle carcasses and things like that for studies. But we don't deal with anything that's entangled. Maybe birds or something if we saw them, we'd turn them loose. Or if we saw something on the beach that we could handle, we'd cut it loose, but not those big ones. I wouldn't get close to the sea lion anyway. Maybe. What's the big part of the debris from the Japanese hurricane tsunami that came? Do you think it'll raise more awareness once it does hit the main part of the United States? It's a good question. It might. I mean, there's been a lot of press coverage on it, and I, I see they're already claiming tsunami debris hitting the lower 48 and some beaches in Alaska, and then they show pictures of. That stuff I just showed you, that pictures I took of five years ago. So, you know, there's, there's no way to really tell tsunami debris. But I, maybe. It depends on how much uh, press pays attention to it. That's all the time we have. So let's give Chris a big round of applause.